All right, so last week, um, I wrote down this equation at some point, I think. Pi, which is a vector, is equal to Pf. So let's, so I need help getting back into physics teaching mode, and you guys probably need help getting into physics learning mode. Um, what, why, when, when can I say that? When can that equation be written? What needs to apply? No net external forces. <clears throat> All right, no net external forces acting on the system that you happen to be interested in. All right, so this is what, we, when we say conservation of momentum, this is what usually we're referring to. The initial total momentum of some system is equal to the final total momentum of some system. And what that implies then is that the impulse, which is equal to what? something like that, is equal to zero in this case. All right, those two things go together. <clears throat> um, so what we're really saying when we're writing this equation then, conserv uh, conservation of momentum, we remember that we finished up with, uh, with an example. We're looking at a car and a truck running into each other. So if I just draw a really quick image to refresh your memory, there was a car and it actually just crashed into this truck. Wow, that's not going to be good. It's okay. All right, so car, truck, crash. Remember, this guy had some initial velocity VC, uh, and this guy had some initial velocity VT, and then they crash and then they bounce apart or something like that. Uh, what we're really, when we're talking about this problem, again, we're saying that conservation momentum applies, initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. And those momentum terms are total momentum terms. So if I write this out in all its glory, I get something like the mass of the car times the velocity of the car plus, and this is the initial velocity, plus the mass of the truck times the velocity of the truck, the initial velocity. That's got to be equal to the mass of the car times the final velocity of the car plus the mass of the truck times the final velocity of the truck. Right, so that's what it looks like in all its, in all its glory. Now, we're going to work with this in a couple different examples today, but, but I'm just writing that out so you can see it. Um, and now we're going to go apply some numbers and sort of go through the methodology of solving a problem, and, but looking at it from two different sort of aspects. So, so let's take this, uh, this truck car example. I'm sorry, I won't cut that off. And just throw some numbers at you. All right, so let's give the mass uh, the car, a mass of uh, 1,500 kilos. Let's give the initial velocity of the car uh, 30 meters per second. We're going to give the truck a mass of, it's a semi, so it's, it's heavy, 20,000 kilos. And the velocity of the truck is negative 20 meters per second. So we're still considering 1D motion here. All right, so they're in a line, so the car is moving to the right, the truck is moving to the left, and they collide. Now I want to go through this. I don't want to jump into conservation of momentum right away. I want to actually look at each system individually. So let's take a look and, just, and let's calculate the momentum of the car. So initially the momentum of the car looks something like this. I should write this consistently. So P sub C comma I, the initial momentum of the car. Well, it's just equal to the mass of the car times the initial velocity of the car. Just plug and chug here. 1,500 kilograms times 30 meters per second. Oh, that's going to be 45,000 kilogram meters per second. <clears throat> right? I can do the same calculation for the initial, initial momentum of the truck. And what I get is 20,000 kilograms times 20 meters per second. And there's a negative sign. So I get negative 400,000 kilograms meters per second. <clears throat> All right, so if I calculate the total momentum, then, then the initial total momentum, P total, 
initial. I just add those two numbers together. It's a vector, so yeah, the negative sign does make a difference. And you get negative 355,000 kilogram meters per second. That's the init total initial momentum. Now, in this example, we're ignoring friction. There are no other external forces applying to those two cars. So my initial momentum, my total initial momentum, has to be equal to my total um, final momentum. And so I could use that here. All right, so I know then that this follows that the total final has got to be the same. No external forces. No net external forces. <clears throat> but uh, before we go to that, I want to I want to take a look at this again. Like I said, take a, go go into a little bit more detail on the on the on the system uh, from an individual standpoint. So. If I, if I tell you this, um, so let's say that when the collision occurs, uh, the truck exerts a force. Uh, we're going to say that force is 100,000 newtons on the car. All right. So let me let me start by asking the first question. What force does the car exert on the truck? You say it so softly. Okay. So sure, negative 100,000 newtons. I guess in this in this case, that number is probably probably negative. But so it exerts the same force. So the force of the uh, the truck on the car, if we include direction, is negative 100,000 newtons. The force of the car on the truck is positive 100,000 newtons. All right. So it's equal and opposite. It's a Newton's third law pair. That's why in our initial sort of setup, I said conservation of momentum is fine, because we're treating the whole thing as a system. So those two forces are internal to our system. <clears throat> All right, but what I want to do is look at, um, but I just want to look at the car now. So let me give you a time. So if that, uh, if that force is exerted over some time, and I picked uh, 0 0.7 seconds. So then I can ask the question, what is the new velocity of the car? All right, so I've given you some force. I've given you some time that the force is exerted. So I can calculate the new velocity of the car. Now, I just want to look at the car here. All right, so here's the car. And I want to know v final. All right, so I'm not. There is no truck in this picture. I'm just thinking about the car. So if I'm just thinking about the car. Can I use conservation of momentum as I wrote it just a minute ago? No. no, because there's there's an external force. There's the force of the truck acting on the car. So there's this big old force here. So I can't use conservation of momentum. So what I have to use is my initial definition of the impulse momentum theorem, which is that the difference between the final and the and initial momenta is equal to the impulse, or the net force, times the time that the force is exerted. <clears throat> All right, well, in this case, I know the initial momentum because I just calculated it up above. I know the force. I know the delta t. So I can solve for the final momentum. So it's equal to the initial momentum plus the net force times delta t. And the net force, there's only one force, so it's just the force of the truck. All right, the initial momentum was 45,000 kilogram meter per second. 
the force of the truck was one negative 100,000 newtons, and delta T was 0 0.7 seconds. <clears throat> so if you do the math, you should get negative 25,000 kilogram meter per second. All right, so negative 25,000 kilogram meters per second. What does that tell me about the final velocity of the car? What direction is it going in? All right, so the car was initially going that way, and so now it's going this way. So it's changed direction. Sort of, you know, might agree with what you'd expect from intuition. A semi and a car collide, probably the car is going to change direction. All right, so we know the final momentum. Well, I was after the velocity. That's just equal to the mass times the velocity. So the velocity then has got to be equal to the momentum, which is 25,000 kilogram meters per second in the negative direction. The mass was 1,500. So the new velocity of the car uh, is negative 16, whoop, negative 16.7 meters per second. Okay, so I got the new velocity of the car. I didn't use conservation of momentum. I used the impulse momentum theorem. All right, the two are related, but there's a difference because in this case we had to account for the force of the truck. But I needed that extra information about the force acting on the truck. Okay, in a minute we'll do another example where I'm going to treat the whole thing as one system. Or we'll actually treat this as a whole system. Okay, so I know the, I know the information about the, the car. Now I want to learn about the truck. So... <clears throat> Um, what does this tell me about the velocity of the truck? Does it tell me anything about the velocity of the truck? Is my velocity of the truck going to be the same? Not necessarily. I mean, there's no reason that it has to be in this case. Uh, is the final momentum of the truck going to be the same? Negative 25,000 kilogram meters per second. No, again, there's no reason that that has to be the same either. They're independent objects. So in order to calculate the velocity of the truck, I need to do the same sort of exercise. I know that the final momentum is going to be equal to the initial momentum plus the force of the car acting on the truck times delta t. Very similar equation than the one that we just worked with. If I plug in my numbers, I've got minus 400,000 kilogram meters per second. The force of the car is 100,000 newtons times delta t, which is 0 0.7 seconds. You do that calculation, you get a momentum, a final momentum of negative 330,000 kilograms meters per second. And then if you calcul calculate the final velocity, just like we did up here, the truck, it's going to be equal to negative 330,000 kilogram meters per second divided by the mass of the truck, which I've already forgotten, 20,000 kilograms. If you do that math, you get a velocity, a final velocity of negative 16.5 meters per second. All right, so no, it's not exactly the same. It's pretty darn close, right? The truck really doesn't slow down very much. Again, though, that sort of makes sense because the truck is so much more massive, it's not really going to be affected that much by the little tiny car. Yeah, Chloe. I have a question why it's so negative because it's like the truck traveling in the negative direction, then when it hits the car, would it it be like kind of bouncing So let, let, me, let me go to the next example. Let's say that you, you had a ping pong ball uh -huh. and you put that ping pong ball uh, on a railroad track, and then a train hit the ping pong ball. Would the train bounce backwards? Mm, no. no. Right? Why? Because it's a really big thing. Because it's a really, well, <laughs> it has to be a really big thing. That would be pretty cool. All right, but the train is so much more massive than the ping pong ball that it doesn't really affect the train. But with right? the car, it did happen because it's smaller. It slowed, so the truck slowed down. The initial velocity of the truck, which I've forgotten already, was what? Negative 20. 
negative 20. So it slowed the truck down, okay. all right? In the case of the ping pong ball on the train, the train's probably not going to slow down by any noticeable amount. Um, but it just didn't slow down very much. So what, what, it, what makes the difference is the, the ratio of the two masses. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So the velocity of the car changed a whole bunch. Yeah. It was going this way, then it got kicked off that way. But the, the truck just kept going that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it, you know, if you had a, if the car was another truck, then the opposite could have happened. That the, right. you know, the first truck could have, they could have bounced off. It just depends on the ratio of the mass, masses. Yeah. So for this exact problem, I would have. I would have. And what I want to show you right now is, so I calculated two things here. I calculated, um, I calculated this number. I did. I tried to change. Maybe orange is very similar. All right. So I tried to. I, I calculated these two numbers. Those are the final momenta of both the car and the truck. So if I calculate the total final momentum, I get minus three hundred thirty thousand kilogram meters per second. Um, minus 25,000 kilogram meters per second, and that's equal to minus 355,000 kilogram meters per second, which should look familiar. That was the total initial momentum. Okay, so the reason that I went through this exercise is to show you that, you know, yes, conservation of momentum holds on the system. We're showing it right here. All right, the final, total final momentum is equal to the total initial momentum. Um, I didn't use that to solve the problem. Had I just been doing this for homework, I would have, because that makes it a bit easier. Um, but you could go about doing it this other way. If I give you a force or something like that, you, could use, you can go that way. All right? Both ways work. Generally, using conservation of momentum is a little bit easier. But there's a problem with conservation of momentum. All right? So let me ask you this next question. Had I said this, so the mass of the car times the velocity of the car initial plus the mass of the truck times the velocity of the truck initial is equal to the mass of the car times the velocity of the car final plus the mass of the truck times the velocity of the truck. I knew I was going to do it. Velocity of the truck final. All right? This statement is conservation of momentum for the entire system. Okay. I know all of this stuff. I don't know this, and I don't know this. So I can't solve that as it's given, right? I couldn't have just jumped right into conservation of momentum and, and hoped for a solution, because I'm missing some information. I, only, I have two unknowns, both final velocities, but I only have one equation. So I, I can't solve that right away. All right, so that's one of the issues with momentum is we, we always have multiple objects, which means that you know a lot of the times we don't. It doesn't seem like we have enough information. All right, we're going to come right back to this in just a second, um, because I'll tell you how you can solve this. But that's another reason why it didn't just make sense to jump right into using conservation of momentum. But really, I was just trying to illustrate the point. Conservation of momentum still applies to the entire system. If I want to, I could separate the two things out, treat them one by one. But I have to include those Newton's third law forces on the respective objects. All right, so this brings us to the next point then. Uh, what we're dealing with here are collisions. And it makes sense now to talk about the types of collisions. So we physicists, we like to break up collisions in, into three different groups. All right, three different groups, groups are Completely inelastic collisions. Complete. If you're not completely, you're partially inelastic. Uh, and then the last group is the elastic collision. All right, so these are the three groups that we typically refer to when we're talking about collisions. So a completely inelastic collision, that's actually sort of the best collision. 
In that case, the objects stick together. Partially in elastic collision, they don't stick together. Um, but they, they, uh, the two objects deform um, or bend or you know break or whatever. Um, something happens to the objects themselves. They, they're affected. Uh, and then in the elastic collision, they don't stick together either. Uh, and they don't deform. Right, so examples of each collision, it's pretty tough to find perfectly inelastic collisions in nature. Um, certainly some car accidents are perfectly inelastic where they do stick together, but the problem is even in perfectly inelastic collisions, sometimes you might lose, you know, like your bumper. So you, you break your car into multiple chunks and then it still isn't perfectly inelastic. But that's usually the typical example is this really nice car crash where they crash and then they're stuck together in one mass. Most, elision, most collisions, or probably to some degree, all collisions are partially inelastic. They're somewhere in between the two extremes of being perfectly inelastic and elastic. Um, so most collisions are perfectly inelastic where the objects don't stick together, um, but they're, they're affected somehow, you know, um, either they're, they're, they bend a little bit or they deform a little bit, and you know, how much depends on the material, but at, to some degree they, they do that. Um, elastic collisions, the classical example of the elastic collision, and we'll do the example in class today, is, is when you take two billiards balls and you shoot them at each other. The balls definitely don't stick together. They're really hard. Um, their molecular structure means that the molecules don't rearrange themselves. They sort of maintain their shape. Right? They don't bend or deform in any way, at least any way that's noticeable to our eye. When these, when these balls collide there, it's a pretty inelastic collision. Now the reason that we break these things up in these groups is, to re is so that we can talk about um, energy as well. So in a completely inelastic collision when the objects stick together, <clears throat> all right, we know something about the kinetic energy of the objects. All right? Because they stick together and because there might be some deformation in the process, the kinetic energy of the system is not conserved. In fact, anytime you have deformation or objects changing shape, something like that, probably the kinetic energy is not conserved. I think it's a good idea to think about, you know, to ask yourself why. Well, why isn't kinetic energy conserved? Oh, no. Sorry. It's okay. Thank you. Okay. I thought you were like writing below the screen. Oh, no, I'm writing in, in the magic middle. Did you ever hand up there? Yeah, when you asked him why. I didn't know if it was Yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, well, if you've got a collision, it loses heat for the mission. So you're going to have some loss of the heat, and things like that. Um, so kinetic energy is going to be lost along those objects. Yeah, exactly. And it's especially, you know, when you have a collision of any sort, even elastic collision, where kinetic energy is conserved. You know, what we have is um, there, are, there are different places where energy can go. So in a collision of any sort, you could have two objects collide together, and there's probably going to be heat, some heat created in that event. So there's probably going to be some energy going into heat. That energy is going to come from kinetic energy. In, in our world, you know, in the, in the types of examples that we do, the velocities are small, so the heat that's created is really, really minimal. So it's neglectable, and so we say kinetic energy is, is, uh, is conserved. But when you have deformation, in that case what you have is you've got kinetic energy that's going into you know, kinetic energy of some part of the object, which then changes its shape. So you have this energy loss because you're rearranging the molecules of your, of your object. Um, and so the only place that energy come, can come from is from the kinetic energy of the system. And it goes into changing the shape or whatever, ejecting something. All right, so, so when you have objects that are sticking together, or when they're, even when they're not sticking together, if they're being deformed, then you have kinetic energy is not being conserved. 
So this is, this is how we break things up. And what we're going to do for the remainder of chapter 9 in this discussion is, is do a couple examples of each type of collision. Okay. So let's do that and let's start with, um, I think we're going to start with playing pool. So the first thing you always have to ask yourself when solving conservation of momentum collision problems is, well, what type of collision is it? So let's start off then with, with an elastic collision where you have two billiard balls. I can make this bigger since apparently I have changed the resolution. Let's make it stand out more. So two billiard balls of identical mass. Wow, that's not right at all. Billiard. All right, so I, uh, of course they all have the same mass. <clears throat> um, and they move towards each other. And I will give you the initial velocities. So the, the speed of the first one is 30 centimeters per second. 30. 30 centimeters per second. <clears throat> um, and V2 is negative 20 centimeters per second. All right? Strangely enough, numbers similar to the truck example. All right, so the two, two balls of mass, of identical mass, move towards each other with, with those speeds. Um, what I want to know if the collision is perfectly elastic, <clears throat> what are their final velocities? <clears throat> All right, so again, you know, the nice thing about these sorts of problems, conservation of momentum, just like conservation of energy, we have a system here where there's all kinds of interesting stuff going on as they collide, but we're just going to ignore that because that complicates the problem. We're just looking for the a difference between the initial and the final co condition. So we have here two balls moving, moving towards each other. You have the purple ball, which is moving with a speed of 30 centimeters per second, and the orange ball which is moving in the opposite direction at 20 centimeters per second, and they collide. We want to know what happens. These are pull balls. They're on a pull table. We're going to ignore any sort of friction. We're going to, there's, we're going to assume there's no deformation as they contact each other. So we have a, an elastic collision, no external forces. So since we have that situation, we, we can use conservation of momentum, which simply says that the total initial momentum has got to be equal to the final total momentum, like so. <clears throat> All right, so if I write down my, my equation then, I, I need to write down the, in, the, the individual components of the momentum, the individual contributions of the momentum. So I have the mass of ball one times the velocity of ball one initially plus the mass of ball two times the velocity of ball two initially. That's got to be equal to the mass of ball one times the velocity of ball one finally, plus the mass of ball two times the velocity of ball two finally. All right, so that's my, that's my whole equation. Now, in this case, nothing, nothing in the initial condition is zero. There's no reason that anything in the final condition should be zero, at least not that I I would that that I know for certain, all right. So I can't really cross anything out like you got in the habit of doing when you're doing those energy problems. So we're just going to have to go with what we have here. Uh, luckily, I know everything on the left-hand side, so I can I can start plugging and chugging. Uh, I got a mass of ball one um, and mass of ball two are equal, which means that all those m's are the same, so they all cancel out. So what I'm left with then is just v one initial plus V2 initial is equal to V1 final plus V2 final. Which makes things a little bit easier. And now if I plug in my numbers, ball one is moving with, at 30 centimeters per second. 
Ball two is moving at negative 20 centimeters per second. And that's equal to V1 final, which I do not know, plus V2 final, which I also do not know. So I have a nice little equation here that says, um, not negative, 10 centimeters per second is equal to V and V1, sorry, V1 final plus V2 final. Right, so I have that equation. Two unknowns, though, so I can't really solve that. So what do I do? Well, I just told you what you should do, basically. It's an elastic collision, which means that kinetic energy is conserved. So like elastic, Ke is conserved. Which means then I can turn to a conservation of kinetic energy equation that's going to look extremely similar to my conservation of momentum equation. So what I write down then is I have 1 half m1 v1 initial squared plus 1 half, oops, 1 half m2 v2 initial squared. And that's equal to 1 half m1 v1 final squared plus 1 half m2 v2 final <coughs> squared. All right? Again, kinetic energy is conserved, and that's what that equation says. The total kinetic energy of the system doesn't change. All these one-halves, those are the same. I can cancel all those things out. I know the initial velocities, the masses, again, they, those would all go away. So I have an equation that's very similar to this equation. Um, again, two unknowns, but they're the same two unknowns. So I have two equations, two unknowns. I can solve for my two unknowns. All right? So I could solve this starting from, from this spot if I wanted to. But I'm going to do a little bit of, of algebra and a little bit of playing around with this equation just to, to illustrate um, a little bit of conceptual behavior of this sort of problem. Show the mathematical outline of what's happening and then you know, sort of talk about what that, what that means. Just because it's, it's sort of interesting. So let's do a little bit of work on this problem and then we'll solve it from that, from that, point, from that point forward. All right, so what I want to do is I just want to put this in a slightly different form. And I'm going to leave the masses in there uh, because what I'm about to do doesn't, doesn't mean that, the, that um, the masses can be what they are. They don't have to be the same. It just happens that they're the same in this, in this case. So I'm going to just rearrange all this stuff. So I'm going to put all the, um, the initial stuff on the left-hand side. I'm sorry, the mass 1 stuff on the left-hand side and the mass 2 stuff on the other side. So this is mass 1 at mass... Mass 1 initial, let's write that again. Mass 1 initial. And then if I bring mass 2 over, I'm going to have mass 2 minus V2 initial. No, I just said all the masses, all the masses on the same side. If I bring the mass 1 final onto this side, I'll have mass 1 times V1 final squared. Sorry. And then likewise, I'm going to combine the mass 2 terms over here. So mass 2 times V2 final squared. And then I'm going to subtract off mass 2 times v2 initial squared. All right, so I'm just rearranging things. The 1 halves all went away. And now what I can do is I can factor out the masses. So I'm going to have mass 1 times v1 initial squared minus v1 final squared. That's equal to mass 2 times v2 final squared minus v2 initial squared. All right, I'm just factoring things out. You, Feel free to take notes on all this stuff, but the important thing is the final, the final result. So if you just want to sort of watch me cruise through it, that's okay. Why? Oh, I've run out of room. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to have to do, to do something here. All right. Sorry. Give me a second while I do that and go up here. Please work. All right. So that's where we're at. OK, now um, what I can do here is I've got these terms, and I can sort of uh, what, unfactor those, I guess. So what I really have here is the product of two, uh, of two, um, two uh, binomials. So what I have here is a v1. I could write this as v1 initial um, minus v1 final times v1 initial plus v1 final. And I can do the same thing on the right-hand side. 
where I'd have um, mass two times V to final minus V to initial times V to final plus V to initial. All right, so I'm just factoring things out. And now I've got this in an interesting form. All right, now this is starting to look more like, I mean, the, these V squared terms, that's like a kinetic energy thing. But when I get rid of the V squared, it starts to look more like um, conservation of, of energy equation. And if you remember back down at the bottom here, whoa, not three fingers, two fingers. Let me go back down to the bottom and grab it. Let's see here. We had this equation. All right, so I'm gonna, just going to plop this guy right here. I said I'm going to plop you right here. How did it work the first time? Oh, I don't know why. I think I kind of know why. Try it again. Oh, I can't do it. I don't know why. All right, so anyway, let me re rewrite that equation. So I had something like, um, I also had an equation that looks like M1 times V1 initial, that's a 1, plus M2 times V2 initial, equals M1 times V1 final plus M2 times V2 final. Looks sort of similar. I could do the same sort of trick here. If I put all the V1, M1 terms on this side and all the M2 terms on the right-hand side and factor out an M1, I'm going to get M1 V1 initial minus V1 final is equal to M2 V2 final minus V1 or V2 initial. So what this says is mass 1 times the difference in the, the initial in the, between the velocities is equal to mass 2 times the difference in the velocities. I have these terms right here. Here's mass 1 times the difference in the velocities. That's this term. I have this term, which is that term. Those two are equal, which means I could just cancel these two out because they're the same. I could divide both sides by either one and they're the same. And so what I'm left with then is v1 initial plus v1 final is equal to v2 final plus v1 initial, v2 initial. And if I de-rearrange these things and now put the initials on the left and the finals on the right, I get v1 initial, v1 initial minus v2 initial equals v2 final minus v1 final. And if I just pull out this negative sign, It'll look like that. All right, a lot, of, a lot of algebra work, but I wanted to show this result because it's, it's actually it's a lot easier to remember this. And this helps you save some time when you're solving these problems because this sort of agrees with what intuition says. What this says then is that if I take, oh, I'm sorry, this, I, I, I messed up there. So that's what I have. I have V2 final minus V1 final. And what I actually wanted to do here is Right, rewrite the right-hand side by pulling out the negative sign and, re and reordering these two. <clears throat> so negative v1 final minus v2 final. All right, so now the terms on both sides look the same. So what this says is if you take the difference in, in speeds of the, first, of the two objects, initially, it's going to be the same later on. All right, it's just going to be in the opposite direction. In other words, the two objects are going to transfer their speeds. That's what this equation says. What this says is that if I have an object coming in <coughs> like so, or this is V1 and this is V2, later on, those two objects are now going to be going in the opposite direction or something like that. But the relative velocity between them is going to be the same. All right? However they change direction, we don't really know. We have to solve the problem for that. But the relative velocity is going to remain the same. In our problem with, with the perfect masses, this is exactly the picture. They both change direction, and they just change the speeds. 
Okay, but if they have different masses, the, the directions may not change, the speeds may not be the same, but the difference between the speeds will be the same. Right? The difference between the two has to stay consistent. That's why I left the masses in there, because this applies regardless of whether or not the masses are the same. Because I took these two terms that each had independent, independent masses and I used them. All right? So this is basically just saying that the relative velocity between the two objects stays the same. Just changes direction. So I can use this now to solve for the actual final velocities. And you can see that since they're the same mass, what's going to happen is they're just going to simply, they're just going to simply exchange, exchange speeds. So what I have here then, if I plug in my numbers, is my initial velocity for one, uh, that was 30 centimeters per second, minus my initial velocity for two, which is negative 20 centimeters per second. That's equal to minus v1 final minus v2 final. All right. In other words, what I have is 50, is 50 centimeters per second equals minus v1f minus v2f. <clears throat> okay. So now I need to go back to my original equation that I, that I, the first one that I solved for. So I had this equation, we'll call it equation number two. Equation number one we wrote way back when, which was 10 centimeters per second, is equal to uh, v, v1 final plus v2 final. I'm just going to, you can solve this in any different way. I'm just going to add them together. So I'm going to get a 60 centimeters per second is equal to minus v1f. Um, let me distribute that negative sign. So net minus V1F plus V2F plus V1F plus V2F. So you can see this V1F and this V1F cancel. So what I get is 60 centimeters per second is equal to twice V2 final. In other words, V2 final is equal to 30 centimeters per second. All right, so V2 final got V1 speed. And I just told you, then you know already, that V1 final is going gonna, is gonna to get the initial speed of V2. But let's just do the math anyway. So what this says is 10 centimeters per second is equal to V1F plus V2F. In other words, V1F is equal to 10 centimeters per second minus V2F, which is 30 centimeters per second. So I get the negative 20 centimeters per second that I expected. So in this case, like I said, the two balls just exchanged speeds, exchanged velocities. But the real point here is that the difference between these two velocities is the same. It's just in the opposite direction. Okay. Things have just been reversed. So we went through a lot of extra algebra to get there. But like I said right away at the beginning there, we could have just we could have solved it, you know, using our basic conservation of energy statement. We could have stopped right here and just done any old method for solving two equations with two unknowns. But I wanted to go through that extra step just to show you that, yeah, if you just remember that the relative velocities stay the same, that'll help you solve the problem a little bit faster.